All right, good morning, everyone. We're gonna go ahead and get started. Thank you everyone for joining us uh, this morning. We are very excited to be partnering with Mutual Ground and Samantha Hoover um, for this recognizing and responding to the impact of trauma on children. My name is Dana Slowinski and I'm co-owner of Family Recovery Centers. And for those of you that don't know us, I'm just gonna give you a quick overview of FRC. We are an adolescent uh, intensive outpatient program, evening program, and we have locations in Lake Bluff, Hoffman Estates, and St. Charles. Uh, we work, <clears throat> excuse me, we work with a wide range um, of adolescents. So uh, we are a DBT based program. So we work with adolescents struggling with maladaptive behaviors such as self injury, substance use, um, sexually acting out, school avoidance, and also depression, bipolar disorder, anxiety, ADHD, kind of a full spectrum. Um, two program components that I like to highlight are parent involvement. So our parents are actually on site with the kids two of the four evenings, um, and they are learning this, the DBT skills right along with their children. And then they're also doing their own work. So we're really diving into and looking looking at uh, the parents' role and dynamics so that we can really get into and make change within the whole family system. And then we also have a 24 seven on call, um, which is in line with the DBT protocol. So our staff and clinicians are available 24 seven to both our parents and patients um, to really help with skills coaching in the moment. So bridging the gap between when they're with us in treatment and in their own environments to really help um, you know, have them utilize skills in their own environments. Um, we That's really us in a nutshell, there's a lot more, but if you have questions, feel free to reach out to myself or Ryan Bright. You can email us. Both of our emails are on the slides at the end. Um, and with that, we are excited. As we said, Mutual Ground is a wonderful organization um, that has been around for a very long time, and we're very excited to be partnering with Samantha. Samantha Hoover is the Clinical Manager of Family Services at Mutual Ground. And thanks, Samantha. I'll turn it over to you. Hello. Um, I'm glad to see all of you guys um, this morning. And thank you for that introduction. I really appreciate that. Uh, we will be talking about recognizing and responding to the impact of trauma on children. And I'll give you um, a little outline of what that means in just a moment. Um, but I did want to start by kind of introducing myself. So I um, am an LCPC, so a licensed clinical professional counselor. Uh, and I have experience working with children, teens, and adults in a variety of different settings, including schools, hospitals, private practice, and um, as she just mentioned, at With Mutual Ground, which is a nonprofit um, organization. And in, in my role at Mutual Ground, I am a supervisor um, of the Family Services Department, but also play a role in advocating for victims of domestic and sexual violence. So Mutual Ground is an organization that provides services to those that have experienced either violence in the home or sexual violence in a variety of different ways. So we are um, providing what we call, you know, full service um, to those, those folks. So we have a, an emergency shelter on site. We're doing legal and medical advocacy. We are doing counseling for adults and children. We are, um, we are doing what we call prevention education, which is, not only trainings like this for other um, service providers, but also trainings in schools for children to learn about um, issues around sexual and domestic violence. And so um, in my role, I do trainings much like this one um, for a variety of different folks, um, because I truly, truly have at my core a belief that you cannot unlearn something once you have learned it. And so when we provide information to folks, we're not, um, we're not necessarily seeing the change that happens or the identification of different issues as they happen down the road. But the more knowledge that folks have, the bigger impact we can have on um, systemic change and also um, helping individuals change. So that is a little bit of background on me. Um, and as I mentioned, here's an outline for today. So we're going to be addressing um, what is trauma. So we're all on the same page as to what um, that word means and how we use it. We're going to talk about how tra trauma impacts folks and especially what trauma looks like in early childhood and the way that trauma influences the brain. 
Then because of the work that I do and what is near and dear to my heart, we're going to talk specifically about kids that have experienced two types of trauma, um, being domestic violence and being sexual abuse or sexual assault. Then we're going to talk about disclosures, um, how they happen and how to handle them. And from there, we will move into um, trauma-informed care and what is best practice for working with children who have experienced trauma. So this is a pretty hefty outline. Um, I'm hoping that two hours is gonna give us plenty of time to get through it. And as I move through the variety of topics, I encourage um, you, if you have questions, to please um, put those questions either in the chat or in that Q&A. Um, and then the folks from Family Recovery Centers is, are gonna be monitoring that and, and um, helping me uh, bring my attention to those questions as we go so that um, I can be including you guys in the workshop so that you get to learn what you need and want from today in addition to what I have planned. So please, um, as many questions as you have, feel free to share them. So that brings us to the first thing on our outline, what is trauma? So I will read this and then I'll speak more to it. So trauma is a response to a deeply distressing or disturbing event that overwhelms an individual's ability to cope, causes feelings of hopelessness, diminishes their sense of self and their ability to feel a range of emotions or experiences. So what is important is not just that trauma is something scary that happens, right? It is deeply distressing and disturbing, but it, it is important for it to be considered a trauma. It needs to be beyond what an individual can cope with. So we, um, you know, we go through life experiencing different types of stressors on a daily basis throughout our day. Um, but many of us have developed ways of coping with stress. And so that stress is considered a healthy stress or a manageable stress. When we experience it, when we feel that fear, we feel that anxiety, but we are able to then manage our emotions and move through it. When something becomes a trauma, is when the event is so scary or so anxiety provoking that it, it goes beyond what an individual can cope with and creates a sense of fear um, that can limit their ability to um, move past it, their, limit their ability to feel like they have power over it. Um, and so you can imagine that trauma impacts children um, sometimes in more profound ways because children have a less developed um, ability to manage stress and to cope because they haven't had the practice that an adult has happened, has had being able to deal with different stressors throughout sort of their life. Um, and so the definition we're working with for trauma is not just something scary, but something that is so scary that it impacts the individual's um, emotion and self, sense of self-efficacy. So the impact of trauma then, when you experience these traumatic experiences, when you have this overwhelm that is happening, um, how does that impact folks? And so I want to start this off, um, if, you, if you would, um, with a question. So what age of a child do you think is most impacted by trauma? What age child is most likely to experience, um, you know, a range of symptoms or, you know, this, this term PTSD or other types of um, potential pathology related to the experience of trauma? Um, and um, I can't, let me see. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. So someone's guessing the teenage years, which I think is a very typical guess that folks um, put out there because teenagers are going through a huge developmental stage where they're learning to become independent, they're learning to become adults. And so when they have that sense of overwhelm, sometimes they don't know how to manage it. Um, I have several folks guessing zero to three infants, toddlers. I have a preschool age guest coming out here. Yes. So um, thinking about preschool kids as they manage trauma, they, they're just learning words and how to express themselves. They're just learning how to socialize with peers. Um, so trauma can have a, a large impact. And here I have um, 
Victoria writes infants with initial brain development. So thank you um, for all of you who put answers in, but that, that Victoria is a, just a, an answer that I really wanna highlight. So we have learned over the years that those who are most impacted by trauma are the smallest kids, those kids in their first year or maybe even their first three years of life are most impacted by trauma because of the extent of brain development, which is happening at that age. And also because when you think about an infant, right? When you think about an infant, what is their ability to cope with stress? What is their ability to mitigate the, the, the effects of trauma? We know that infants are in fact very dependent on caregivers to meet not only their physical needs, but also to meet their emotional needs. And so when they're experiencing a trauma, they don't have the skill set yet to mitigate the effects of that trauma. And at the same time, behind the scenes, that trauma is changing pathways of brain development and brain development is happening most rapidly in an infant. Um, I'm gonna show you a little video. Um, this, this is a clip from a larger video. This is like a 22 minute video called First Impressions um, by Dr. Bruce Perry and he'll make a small guest appearance. Um, but I, I like the way this highlights some of that information. And um, if you're interested, you could seek out the longer version of the video, but we're just gonna watch about three minutes right now. Because of the way the brain works, you will always remember your very first roller coaster ride. Storing these new experiences is one of the brain's main jobs. In fact, your brain creates a mental blueprint of every new experience you have. A blueprint for any new touch is stored in one part of the brain. A blueprint for any new sound in a different part. And a blueprint for any new sight in still another part. But as powerful as that first roller coaster ride was, it can't compete with the lingering effects of your brain's earliest experiences. Although you have no conscious memory of this part of your childhood, it is these very first experiences that literally become the building blocks for your whole life. Unlike other organs, the brain is undeveloped at birth and it is waiting for experiences to shape how it will develop. The amazing thing about the human brain is that the younger you are, the more sponge-like your brain is which is the reason that children in three years can learn language, can learn to walk, can do all kinds of incredible things. But the very same biological sponginess that allows us to rapidly acquire language is also the same sponginess that makes young children more vulnerable to trauma than older children. Well, we have the opportunity to do police ride-alongs to a domestic violence situation and so this was actually the first call I ever rode along. It was dinner time and they were having spaghetti for dinner. It was dripping down the walls, the kitchen table was overturned and we had three children in the household. Looking at this whole situation at the time, we said uh, no evidence of physical harm, the kids are fine. We learn differently, of course. The boy in the corner it was classic behavior that we see with kids who have had chronic exposure to violence. He would just completely zone out, numb out, as things started to get scary. The six-year-old little girl on the chair blames herself for what's going on. But actually, it was four years later that we really appreciated uh, who had some of the most profound or severe harm coming out of this situation, and that was the six-month-old baby who was now four and a half and had seriously injured another child in preschool. It's literally the opposite of the way most people think about this. Most people think young children, they don't really understand what's going on and they're resilient, but the fact is if anybody's impacted more severely, it's the younger child. Okay, so what I want you to take with you 
from this video and not just for today, but for the, your future in working with clients and working with children, um, I want you to remember the spaghetti family. Um, we're going to talk later about a little bit more about how to recognize when a kid has experienced trauma, but I want you to remember the spaghetti family and those three children because those three children are sort of the hallmark three ways that we see kids presenting as they've experienced trauma. So you have the boy in the corner and she says he was numbed out, zoned out. So one of the types of kids that we see are kids who are dissociating, kids who are withdrawn, they're not socializing with peers, they're kind of living in their own headspace, numbed out, they're not having a range of emotions, they have that flattened affect um, and zoned out, right? So they're having issues with um, remaining in the moment, staying focused, um, concentrating on the task at hand. So that's Kid number one, the boy in the corner. The second one is the little girl on the chair, right? And she blames herself. So that little girl is experiencing um, heightened levels of anxiety, right? But also we imagine that this little girl is taking on um, some type of parentified role. She believes that she should be able to control the violence. She should have kept her family safe. She should have, should have, should have. And so when you have a kid in front of you who has all of those should haves, right? That I could have done this, I should have done that, I wish I would have that, that kind of anxiety can be a trauma response because kids feel like they don't have that control. So remember part of trauma is that loss of self-efficacy, that loss of ability to manage what is happening. And so in order to try to take some of that control and self-efficacy back, there is a, a pattern where children will try to um, blame themselves or take the responsibility for what has happened. So that's the second type of kid that we are looking for. And the third one, probably the more obvious one for many of us is that baby in the crib. She says, at four and a half years old, he had seriously injured another child. So we are used to, I think, thinking of kids who've experienced trauma as those kids who are physically acting out, expressing aggression, um, having you know, accelerated mood swings, um, difficulties with anger, um, and not really um, being able to manage that you know, safe touch and safe interaction with other folks. So a, a difficulty with social skills. So that would be the third type of kid. So we're looking for kids who are numbed out, zoned out, kids who are blaming themselves and kids who are acting out in physically aggressive ways. It's, it's deeper than that. And there are other reactions to trauma, but if you walk away from today, remembering to look for those three types of kids, um, I think you will have learned a lot. And I think you will have your eyes much more wide open um, as you move forward um, and work with kids and try to identify uh, where trauma is, is happening. Um, are there any questions at this point or? No questions so far. Okay. All right, like I said, if you have questions, throw them in the chat or throw them in that Q&A. Um, I'm gonna keep throwing stuff at you. So if anything comes up, please um, feel free to ask questions or, or to stop me. So um, next, I, I wanna move from this idea of how trauma impacts children to really talking about ACEs. So many of you um, have probably heard this term ACEs before. It stands for Adverse or Negative Childhood Experiences. Study is the S. So Adverse Childhood Experiences um, are, are what we call ACEs. Um, and truly what an adverse childhood experience is, is in fact, um, what could be considered a trauma in, in many cases. And so some examples of ACEs are experiencing violence, abuse or neglect, witnessing violence in your home or in your community, uh, having a family member attempt or die by suicide, or growing up in a home where substance use, mental illness, parental separation or incarceration are happening. 
And so when we think about adverse childhood experiences, we're thinking about that disruption, right? What causes fear that is great enough, right, to disrupt the child's ability to cope with what is happening in their home? And so um, this is a relatively comprehensive list, but I'm sure if you sit with it for a moment, you can think of other types of childhood trauma that might be, um, you know, that might, that could maybe be listed here as well. Um, and so it, it doesn't mean that other experiences can't cause that trauma response in a child. It's just, these are the ones that have sort of been studied in the adverse childhood experience a study, and these are um, the more modern version of what the study originally was looking at. So a little bit more comprehensive than maybe it was back uh, when the original study was done. So what does that mean? Um, these We're listing what these traumatic experiences could be, but what does that mean for the kids that we work with? Well, I think it's important for us to really zone in and narrow in on this idea that adverse childhood experiences are extremely extremely prevalent. They are happening to kids um, across all socioeconomic statuses, all races, all ethnicities, all geographical locations, all gender identities and expressions. Um, no one is sort of safe from childhood trauma in that sense. So it, a lot of times you'll hear people say, oh, well, that's, you know, that's that community or that happens to those folks, but it happens to um, all folks. Right? And so we want to really be thinking, whatever child I have in front of me, I need to be conceptualizing that child and asking myself the background questions of what has this child experienced? Has this child been through trauma? And here um, I've just listed for you 21% of um, folks that were in the, in the most recent ACEs study um, identified that they had been sexually abused as a child. 13% stated that they had witnessed domestic violence in their home as a child. 27% saw substance use in their home. 11% were themselves emotionally abused. 28% physically abused. 5% had an incarcerated family member. There are more statistics beyond this, um, but right here, I, I really focused on the ones that impact folks um, that we might see at mutual ground. So like I said, we are seeing kids who've experienced sexual abuse, who've witnessed domestic violence, and we have now um, acquired an additional part of our agency called Breaking Free, um, and they are helping folks that have uh, substance use issues. And so um, again, kids that are coming into that program are kids who have witnessed substance use in their home um, and the effects of, of that type of trauma. And so um, well, I say that to say many folks think, okay, well, people who've experienced those issues, they go to a place like neutral ground. We send them to a specific center, but I want you to know that if you work in a school, if you work in a counseling agency, you work in a hospital, kids are bringing these issues of trauma with them everywhere they go. So you can't find a place where you work with kids and none of the kids that you're working with have experienced any of these issues. So if you have contact with children, you wanna have always this mindset of assessing for whether trauma is happening. And so I would encourage those of you who do work with children who have some sort of intake process, psychosocial assessment, evaluation, paperwork, whatever that looks like, I would encourage you to try to weave into your agency questions that assess for these experiences in children, because the earlier we can intervene and provide that treatment for the trauma, the better outcomes we see for kids. So we want to know what has happened to these children, what has happened in the home as much as we possibly can. Um, and why is this important, right? What is the impact of experience and of experiencing an adverse childhood experience um, when you are in childhood is that you have lasting impacts that go into adulthood as a result of your experience with trauma. So um, outcomes that are associated with ACEs include increased injuries, right? So if you're experiencing neglect or abuse in your home, um, 
you're more likely to experience injuries like fractures, burns, traumatic brain injury, those type of things. As you grow and move into um, adulthood, but even as a child, you're more likely to experience mental health concerns such as depression, anxiety, post-traumatic stress disorder, which seems a bit obvious, right? If you experience a trauma, you're more likely to have PTSD um, and then suicide. So that includes suicidal gestures and also completion of suicide. Both are more likely in folks that have experienced trauma. Um, maternal health outcomes, right? So unintended pregnancy is more common. Um, the higher your ACE score, um, complications in pregnancy and also fetal death um, are all higher in folks that have experienced one or more adverse childhood experiences, but also get incrementally higher with the more that you have experienced. So if you, for example, have lived in a home where your parents were in a domestic violence relationship and they were using substances, and as a result of them using substances and being in a domestic violence relationship, you often experience neglect and sometimes experience direct physical abuse and emotional abuse. Now I'm at six. So if you've experienced those six ACEs as a child, your health outcomes are worse than somebody who's only experienced one or two ACEs or none, right? So as we move into more and more ACEs, um, we're more and more impacted. Um, okay, continuing down the list, infectious diseases like HIV and STDs are more common in folks with ACEs. Chronic disease, um, which I'm going to play a, a short video again um, from Nadine Burke Harris, and she talks about chronic disease because I think we are quick to say, oh, well, folks who've experienced trauma, they cope in negative ways and therefore they have worse health outcomes, but she kind of debunks that to say, um, that regardless of whether folks are engaging in, you know, smoking or alcohol use or those things, their chronic disease outcomes are still worse. Um, despite the fact that that engaging in risky health behaviors does um, also increase with the youth with the experience of adverse childhood um, experiences. And then lastly, um, opportunity. So that kind of goes in the other direction, right? So the more ACEs you have, the, the more likely you are to have less education than somebody with lesser um, adverse childhood experiences, the more likely you are to have a lower lifetime income than somebody with less adverse childhood experiences. So um, when we think about health in a holistic sense, um, you know, education, and income and these things also impact people for the long term. So, so this is why trauma is so important. This is why it's so important to identify and attempt to mit mitigate the effects of trauma on children so that we don't have this, um, you know, life sentence of ongoing health concerns, right? We want folks to receive the help and the services they need in order to improve that, the long-term outcomes. Um, so some more statistics about ACEs. One in six adults have experienced four or more ACEs as a child. So if you are thinking about the adults that you work with, maybe as clients, but also the adults you work with as coworkers, right? Looking and thinking about the fact that if 21% of people said they were sexually abused as a kid, then, then as you look around at your coworkers, one in five of them is an adult survivor of child sexual abuse. And as you look around at your coworkers, you see one in six of them experienced four or more ACEs as a child. So keeping that in mind as we work with other folks, not that trauma-informed care and the trauma-informed approach can be used not only with clients, but can also be used in our interactions in our workplace or in the supermarket or with other family members, those kinds of things. Um, again, five of the top 10 leading causes of death are associated with ACEs. So we saw cancer, diabetes, heart disease on that other page, um, but also uh, you know, death by suicide and some other ones. 44% um, of adult depression could be eliminated if we prevented ACEs. So again, um, that is looking at 
folks who experience no ACEs, what is their level, what is their likelihood of having depression as an adult versus those that have experienced ACEs and what is their likelihood as depression as an adult? And looking at the fact that it's 44% higher in those that have experienced ACEs. And so if we were able to prevent trauma from occurring in childhood, we could prevent you know, not just depression, but many of these other outcomes from happening. Um, if there are no questions, then I am going to play the video as promised um, from Nadine Burke Harris. Um, she is a physician who has done a lot of work in the area of adverse childhood experiences. And um, she's going to give us a maybe some overlap of what I just covered, but she says things so much better than I do that I like to, um, you know, not just steal from her, but allow her to, to speak to her research on her own. Um, I think that, that she explains things in a way that will really drive it home for each of you. So this video is about four minutes long. Okay. Two things. Number one, ACEs are incredibly common. 67% of the population had at least one ACE, and 12.6%, one in eight, had four or more ACEs. The second thing that they found was that there was a dose-response relationship between ACEs and health outcomes. The higher your ACE score, the worse your health outcomes. For a person with an ACE score or four or more, their relative risk of chronic obstructive pulmonary disease was two and a half times that of someone with an ACE score of zero. For hepatitis, it was also two and a half times. For depression, it was four and a half times. For suicidality, it was 12 times. A person with an ACE score of seven or more had triple the lifetime risk of lung cancer and three and a half times the risk of ischemic heart disease, the number one killer in the United States of America. Well, of course, this makes sense. You know, some people looked at this data and they said, come on, you know, you have a rough childhood, you're more likely to drink and smoke and do all these things that are gonna ruin your health. This isn't science, this is just bad behavior. It turns out this is exactly where the science comes in. We now understand better than we ever have before how exposure to early adversity affects the developing brains and bodies of children. It affects areas like the nucleus accumbens, the pleasure and reward center of the brain that is implicated in substance dependence. It inhibits the prefrontal cortex, which is necessary for impulse control and executive function, a critical area for learning. And on MRI scans, we see measurable differences in the amygdala, the brain's fear response center. So there are real neurologic reasons why folks exposed to high doses of adversity are more likely to engage in high-risk behavior. And that's important to know. But it turns out that even if you don't engage in any high-risk behavior, you're still more likely to develop heart disease or cancer. The reason for this has to do with the hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis, the brain's and body's stress response system that governs our fight or flight response. How does it work? Well, imagine you're walking in the forest and you see a bear. Immediately, your hypothalamus sends a signal to your pituitary, which sends a signal to your adrenal gland that says, release stress hormones, adrenaline, cortisol. And so your heart starts to pound, your pupils dilate, your airways open up, and you are ready to either fight that bear or run from the bear. And that is wonderful. If you're in a forest and there's a bear. <laughs> but the problem is what happens when the bear comes home every night. And this system is activated over and over and over again. And it goes from being adaptive or life-saving to maladaptive or health-damaging. Children are especially sensitive to this repeated stress activation 
because their brains and bodies are just developing. High doses of adversity not only affect brain structure and function, they affect the developing immune system, developing hormonal systems, and even the way our DNA is read and transcribed. So for me, this information threw my old training out the window, because when we understand the mechanism of a disease, when we know not only which pathways are disrupted, but how, then as doctors, it is our job to use this science for prevention and treatment. That's what we do. Um, wow, that video still is so powerful. I think that just hearing the, I mean, it's humorous, but her saying, that works if you're in the forest and there's a bear. Um, but what if the bear comes home every night? And that's what we're looking at with the kids that we are talking about, these children who are experiencing trauma. Very infrequently um, with these types of trauma, is it a one-time event? So there, there are traumas like a, like a significant car crash or um, a major major illness and hospitalization that happened to a child for a very limited time um, specific moment. And they have that trauma response in that moment. But for the majority of what we're talking about with adverse childhood experiences, children are not experiencing child sexual abuse as a one-time event. It is most often an ongoing event. They're not experiencing the witnessing of substance use in their home as a one-time event. It is ongoing. They're not experiencing domestic violence or physical abuse, emotional abuse, neglect as a one-time event. These are traumas that are ongoing. And as um, Dr. Berkaris says, because of that, you have an activation of the hypothalamic pituitary axis over and over and over again. And that becomes health detrimental. That becomes maladaptive, even though the system is originally in place to help us run from the bear. Um, and so let's talk about that a little bit more in depth. What does trauma do to the brain? Um, and she gave us a great intro and she's a doctor, so she maybe explain things better than I can, but I'm going to try to break it down a little bit further to help us think about it. So when we are thinking about the, what she's talking about, okay, so the, this um, hypothalamic pituitary response um, axis and the, and the response to that, we're talking about the sympathetic nervous system in a, in a, in a larger sense, okay? Um, because the, the pituitary gland pumps out hormones and um, it is going to pump those out at a heightened level when we have this fight, flight, or freeze response, okay? So that's what she's getting at. So sympathetic nervous system is when you go into that fight, flight, or freeze. So she talked about your heart beats faster, your pupils dilate, your airways open, and you're ready to fight the bear or run away, right? And so when we talk about fight, flight, or freeze, we are talking about that stress response, okay? So because that stress response causes your heart to beat faster, when this happening over and over again, day in and day out, this directly impacts um, your heart's functioning. And they, this is a pathway to leading to that heart disease later in life. Um, as she said, your pupils dilate, right? But also your blood vessels constrict. And because your blood pressure, your blood vessels constrict, and your heart is beating faster, blood pressure is going to go up. And so if you have a heightened blood pressure day in and day out in childhood, right, then that can lead to hypertension and issues of blood pressure, um, high blood pressure in, in adulthood. And then again, we have um, 
like she said, this pituitary gland is pumping out hormones and, and going to those hormones are going to the adrenal gland. The adrenal gland is then releasing cortisol as we've all heard about cortisol and we've watched these, you know, weight loss videos, get rid of cortisol, you'll lose weight and all this. Um, but cortisol does um, get pumped out during that stress response. And that can be related to weight gain, which we'll talk about a little bit on the next page, but because we're in a stress response mode, right? Our body has shuts down certain systems and heightens other systems, right? And so in, in response to that, um, we can experience things like osteoporosis because cortisol is, um, is stopping the sort of normal part of the body that creates bone by taking, you know, calcium out of the bloodstream. We need calcium um, in the bloodstream when we are using a lot of muscles. And so um, the body stops the process of bone rebuilding when we're in that stress mode. Um, so this, again, can lead to osteoporosis or arthritis. Um, cortisol also uh, impacts the brain and can lead to depression, right? And can lead to weight gain as well. Um, and because of the way that cortisol impacts multiple different organ systems and their functioning, we can see um, autoimmune diseases developing more frequently in folks that are experiencing um, this fight, flight, or freeze on a regular ongoing basis. And then, like she said, your airways open and your, your breathing quickens. And so again, she, she mentioned in there that, um, there are worsening health outcomes, even if, so it's not necessarily that there's, you're more likely to be a smoker or to live in a environment that's healthy for your lungs. It is also true that that sort of constant overuse can lead to lung disease as well. And so um, when we think about this stress, this fear response, I, I want you to think about, you know, the ways that um, the body needs to respond in order to survive when there is a bear. And then I want you to think about what it means to be in survival mode in this place of stress, um, and activation of the sympathetic nervous system over and over again, day in and day out, years upon years, right? Um, and how that changes health, outcome, health outcomes for folks. The um, much less talked about sister nervous system, okay, is called the parasympathetic nervous system. So sympathetic nervous system does fight, flight, or freeze. It is activated or turned on in the stress response. And at the same time, the parasympathetic nervous system is shut down during that fear response. Cause you kind of only can have one or the other as you see in this teeter totter picture, you're either doing fight, flight or freeze or you're doing rest and digest but you're not doing both at the same time. So new, um, this might be a new uh, little mnemonic for folks, uh, fight, flight or freeze. I think we've all heard a billion times, but for the parasympathetic nervous system, I want you to remember rest and digest. And then as we go through these, be thinking to yourself, what would it be like to live in a constant state of fear where your body never has the chance to rest and digest because you're always doing fight, flight, or freeze. So if you never have the chance to rest or digest, that that means your digestive system, right, is kind of closed down. You are not um, absorbing sugar from the bloodstream into um, your your muscle and fats because you're not completing this process of digest, um, and so that can lead to type two diabetes or high cholesterol because you are never doing. Enough 
be kind of neglected and um, we start to create issues of autoimmunity like lupus, like MS, like rheumatoid arthritis, fibromyalgia. And so over time, this the impacts right of living in a place where you never get to rest or digest can impact long term outcome term uh, long term outcomes in terms of uh, the immune system. And then of course the last one almost feels obvious, right? If you're never digesting, right, you're going to have issues with the digestive system. Okay, so you are going to have issues with stomach aches, colon cancer, obesity, gastroenteritis. Um, acid reflux, um, because the digestive system is kind of, again, being neglected. It's being shut down, turned off so often that that normal process of digestion is so disrupted that we have the impact uh, long-term for what that looks like. And then let's talk about brain development itself. Um, so I know that Dr. Bruce Perry mentioned in that, that brief video that I showed you at the beginning that the brain is very underdeveloped at birth and becomes developed as um, babies and children experience life experiences and those pathways are carved um, sort of as, as we go. So I want you to think about the brain being built from the back to the front and from the bottom to the top. So we start at the base and the base is called the brain stem, okay? The brain stem is the part of the brain that is functioning in a one day old, zero, one hour old infant, okay? It is the very basic survival brain. So what can a one day old baby do? They can scream, right? That's what you're waiting for when they, when your baby's first born, you're waiting for them to take a big breath and scream. So respiration is there. They can use their lungs. Um, they're, they can eat and they can eat and poop and then they can sleep, right? So the, a, a, a tiny infant is doing just basic functions. So when we think about traumatic experiences, impacting the development of the brain during the development of the brainstem. So in utero, before the baby is born, if that, if that fetus is experiencing traumatic stress while the brainstem is developing, right? Or in those first few days of life, the first few weeks, while the baby can only do, you know, breathing, eating and sleeping, if there is disruption, if there is trauma that is occurring during that time period, we see disruptions to brain stem development that can lead to things like asthma and allergies because respiration is, is impacted. We can see things like stomach pain or chronic issues with digestion, um, acid reflux in babies. Um, these kinds of conditions can be heightened when um, an infant has experienced trauma in utero and then sleep pattern disruption. So I'm not saying that your baby should be born and immediately um, have some kind of sleep pattern that allows you to get work done and not be up all night. But for those babies who struggle to stay asleep or to fall asleep, those babies who don't sleep enough hours in a 24 hour period, um, we wanna be thinking to ourselves whether or not there's some kind of trauma disruption to the brain stem's development. Um, and then again, from the brain stem, we're building upward to the midbrain. Midbrain is the next thing that is developing. Um, midbrain is really going to be developed within that first year of life. Um, it should be, you know, forming and, and solidifying itself based on child's experiences. And what the midbrain does is the midbrain controls your ability to focus your attention and to concentrate on something. And the midbrain mid is in charge of assessing for safety and responding to perceived threat, okay? So if you have an infant, right? This is where, this is where we start having these conversations about attachment, right? Um, if you have an infant who is 
scanning their environment and feels unsafe, right? What do they do? They cry for their parent, right? They, they're responding to this perceived threat. They feel anxious, they cry, they whine, they yell. And then the parent comes, right? And attends to the baby and, re, and brings the baby back to a place of feeling safe by feeding them, by changing them, by soothing them, by cuddling them, by, by doing these nurturing things, right? And so then the baby continues to assess, okay, now things are safe, my caregiver is here. And then, oh, I, I have another, you know, threat response because now I'm, I'm, I'm hungry and I'm, and I'm starving because babies just go immediately into, I'm starving. And then again, they, they cry, they, they, they whine, they, they try to get their needs met. And when those needs are being met continually by a caregiver, then the child is able to come back down to baseline to return to this place of safety, to return to this place of comfort, right? And so at, at this point, the regulation of a child is very much related to attachment to an attentive caregiver, to a caregiver who can meet their needs. And so when we are in a situation of ongoing threat, right? So remember when, when the system is overwhelmed, when there is a trauma happening because self-regulation is not possible, there are not coping skills known to that person that bring them back down when they don't have a caregiver who's mitigating the stress, then the child is experiencing trauma, 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 okay? Then we're going to see a disruption in these processes that occur in the midbrain. Um, and so that attachment that occurs in the first few years of life helps to mitigate any threats that are occurring. And when we have trauma, trauma disrupts not only the child's ability to respond to threat and safety, but also the child's ability to create attachment with caregiver, okay? And so what we're looking for, and when we have kids that are presenting as um, having difficulty with heightened anxiety, they're overreacting to stress, they're not able to soothe themselves, um, they, you know, something small happens and it, and it looks like the end of the world because they don't have those regulation skills. But also remember concentration was the other part of the midbrain. So when we have kids who are responding um, to the trauma that they have experienced, right, the development of the brain has changed in terms of concentration. What we see in front of us is a kid who isn't able to concentrate, a kid who looks hyperactive, a kid who's very distractible, not able to attend to whatever task or project is at hand. And so um, the challenge that we have is to think of these potential problems, these symptomologies as trauma response, what has happened to the child. Because what, maybe somebody wants to throw it in the chat. If you had a kid in front of you that is hyperactive, easily distracted, has a overreaction to stress and heightened anxiety. What are what are you thinking is going on with that kid? Yeah, thank you. Thank you for being brave, Shana. Um, yes, Stephanie, you are thinking, thank you. You guys nailed both of them, right? So when we have a kid in front of us who has been labeled at age three, there it's a three-year-old, but they have ADHD. Right, and that's it, we just slap a label. They're ADHD, they're a hopeless cause, right? Um, they're gonna have it forever. We wanna be asking ourselves, sure, maybe they do have a true diagnosis of ADHD. They definitely meet the criteria. It may be very true that medication is helpful because their brain is changed, right? But at the same time, if we have a young child or even an eight, nine, 10, 11 year old who's experiencing ADHD, we want to be asking ourselves, did this child experience trauma in those first three years of life? Because we may have a different path for um, attacking, so to speak, this ADHD and helping them to learn to cope with it 
if we know that this ADHD is coming from an experience of trauma, which has impacted brain development. And yes, Stephanie, the other thing that people will be thinking is spectrum related concern, right? So people might be thinking this kid seems like they're on the spectrum. They can't concentrate. They don't attune. They don't they don't create, they don't make eye contact. They are, remember I told you, having issues with attachment. So they're not looking to their caregiver to help them mitigate stress. They are overreacting to their experiences of anxiety. They're perceiving many, many things as a threat that the rest of us might not see as threatening, right? And so I, I'm not saying that all ADHD or all spectrum disorders are as a result of trauma. But what I'm saying is when we have a kid with this list of symptoms, we now know that those same symptoms could be a trauma response or could be that diagnosis. And I'm not saying there are not endogenous ADHD um, diagnoses out there where it is truly a brain chemistry thing and we can fix it with medication. I'm also not saying that because ADHD was maybe caused by trauma that medication isn't helpful. I'm just saying we want to be thinking about bigger picture. What else has happened? What else might help the child? And the same thing with spectrum disorder, right? So many times kids on the spectrum may not be able to tell us in the same ways um, about their experience of trauma when they were younger or ongoing, but we want to be thinking about and assessing whether or not that is also something that impacts them. Um, and work with them in that through that lens, in addition to the lens of their diagnosis. Um, so not not just leaning on diagnosis as the as the end all be all, I guess you could say. Um, so thank you for being brave and answering in the chats. And um, please, as each of you moves forward in the work that you do, when you see these concerns coming up, please be asking yourself. Um, what's the rest of the story? How, how have we gotten to this place with this child? Um, okay, limbic system. Limbic system is um, another part of the brain which develops. The limbic system is very important because the limbic system is doing memory and it's also doing mood regulation, okay? And so um, if, you, if you want to, uh, um, take away one thing from the, from this idea about the limbic system, it's this. So often we have victims, be it child victims, adult victims, teenage victims who have, um, blind spots in terms of their memory about the trauma. And historically victims have been labeled as uncooperative, um, as liars, right? Because, you know, he didn't tell us everything. She's leaving out details. She won't answer all of my questions. Therefore, they're lying. They made it up. They, you know, it's not the truth. It never happened. So what I want you to hear from me for the limbic system today is that you cannot do extreme, overwhelming mood regulation, right? And at the same time, do memory creation because you're working within the same system. So when you have an extreme emotion, right? Like extremely terrified, which is what is usually happening in a trauma situation. When you are extremely terrified, the limbic system is overwhelmed by the need to manage your extreme terror and therefore stops making memories in that extreme terror moment. And so for many folks, they are truly lacking bits and pieces of their memory. And I'm talking about episodic memory. So the narrative type of memories that we create um, are missing from those very traumatic moments. What memories are still being created in other parts of the brain are memories of the sensory experience. So this is why folks might remember what they smelled or what they heard or what they were feeling, but they don't remember like first came this, then came that, I was doing this, he said that, 
those the episodic storytelling part of memory isn't working when we're in extreme terror. And so we should help our, our clients to lean on the other parts of memory that maybe were functioning better um, at the time of trauma. Um, so we don't want to approach a victim from this standpoint of they're being uncooperative, they're not telling the whole truth, they're holding things back, they're lying, because they may truly be trying to remember and not have those memories there. Um, similarly, right, um, just so you can kind of remember, if you've ever had somebody tell you they were so angry that they blacked out, uh, that's, a, that's a similar experience, right? So you can have this extreme overwhelming terror and not create episodic memory. You can also have an extreme overwhelming rage and that rage can overwhelm the limbic system and also interrupt that memory creation. And um, at the same time, you have people who are blackout drunk. This is the same idea. So they're not going to later remember because that alcohol has impacted the ability of the limbic system to function um, because of the way that it, it impacts that system. You're not creating memories at the time. So they're not like deep down hidden memories that you eventually can get to and remember. They're, they're not there because they weren't created at the time. So this experience of blacking out can happen for a variety of reasons, but this is the system that's being impacted. Now, if you're having this experience of blacking out from extreme terror um, repeatedly, the system's pathways begin to change and form in a way that's atypical. And so that can lead to you periodically not creating episodic memories, even when you're not experiencing terror. It can also lead to you experiencing rage or terror or elation or these extreme emotions um, when it's not really uh, appropriate to be experiencing those emotions, when there's not really a trigger that warrants it. And so what we see for, for kids who are impacted in their limbic system is this idea of forgetfulness, um, having difficulty remembering things. And then also this idea of labile mood, mood swings, right? So you're, you're extremely happy and you're extremely angry and you're extremely sad and you're extremely scared and you, your emotions are very difficult for you um, to regulate because you're experiencing them kind of at a heightened level. Um, and so that's limbic system. And then lastly here, I have the cerebral cortex. Um, and the cerebral cortex is the, is the front part of your brain, sometimes called the frontal cortex or prefrontal cortex. It's all part of the cerebral cortex. Um, but this is the part of the brain that's conscious. This is the stuff that we, this is where we do all of our thinking. Um, and this part of the brain, at this point, they say continues developing until about age 26. Okay. So when I think about the cerebral cortex, I think about, uh, I want you to be thinking about teenagers, right? And people, you know, teenagers get a bad rap. We say a lot of things about teenagers. What we say that they, they're impulsive. They don't know how to plan ahead, right? They're, they're, they're moody. They have, you know, they have big feelings, right? Um, and they're oppositional, they're argumentative. They might be withdrawn. They might be, um, you know, pushing people away from themselves. And a lot of teenagers are really struggling um, in terms of school, right? As school becomes more and more challenging as you, as you move into those teenage years. So think about the cerebral cortex as all the things that teenagers need to be able to do, okay? That's what's developing in your teenage years. And so sometimes this part's developing more than that part and this part's get, you know, getting all the attention. And so we see that teenagers go through kind of these shifts. What I want you to think about is that during those years, starting from small, because the cerebral cortex is developing, but especially going, you know, through fifth grade and through all the way, you know, like I said, through age 26, when you're experiencing trauma during this um, advanced development of the cerebral cortex, you begin to have issues um, with that, that pattern of brain development that can lead um, far and beyond, you know, the teenage years, or it can be much more exaggerated than what we would expect in a, in a typically developing teenager.
Um, and so the, we're looking for um, that ability to plan. We're looking for emotional expression, be behavior. Um, what I usually say at this point is that if you have children that you are working with who have some reason that they now require an IEP or 504 plan at school, you wanna be asking yourself whether or not they've experienced trauma. Because most IEPs and 504 plans are looking at developmental delays, which we obviously is related based on everything we've been talk talking about. They are based on um, behavioral concerns, emotional concerns, or they are based on um, learning, learning difficulties or disabilities. And so as we, as we see, those things are all kind of related to trauma occurring. So they're not, it doesn't change the fact that the student still needs additional support. It doesn't change the fact um, that, you know, the school should provide that to them, but it, it should change the way that we think about them. Like, oh, that, that not, we don't want to just write kids off as like, oh, that's a behavior disorder kid. Oh, they have a behavior disorder. They're over there. We want to be thinking, okay, they're, they're struggling with managing their behaviors appropriately in school. What has led to that? What could there be trauma history? Could there be something else going on that is impacting um, the, the brain development and therefore impacting behavior? Um, so just always kind of bringing ourselves back to this place of how does trauma play a role or could trauma potentially be playing a role in you know, whatever um, children are, are experiencing? Samantha, we do have one question. What? And I think it's related. So it says, one thing I'm wondering about is when, how do we differentiate trauma versus something that was very difficult to cope with? I can see many difficult moments falling under the trauma category, but I'm also sure not everything would be considered trauma. Yeah. Um, and so that's why I, I tried to start with that definition at the beginning. Um, and so some things might be a trauma. Let's say you have two siblings, okay, and they go through the same experience. One of them may experience that difficult situation as a trauma and the other one may not because trauma, the definition is really dependent on whether or not you are able to cope with the level of stress that is occurring and whether or not you have a feeling of loss of control, loss of self-efficacy and inability to kind of handle that situation because that loss of of control creates just like a next level type of fear response. And so both of them may have had a heightened fear response, but one of them maybe have been able to mitigate that fear response and shut it down fairly quickly. And the other one may not have had the ability to do that. And so they experience it as a trauma. Um, I, think, I think that um, we don't, we don't always define that for folks. We allow folks to define it for themselves. Tell me about what that was like for you. Um, tell me about what you did in that moment. What did you feel in that moment? Um, and so allowing folks to kind of share their story and then we can kind of not out loud say, oh, that doesn't count as a trauma. We're not gonna tell, <laughs> tell that to a child or tell that to a parent, but we can be assessing in our mind whether, um, you know, whether that is the level of what we're looking at. Um, I also think it's important for us to, to kind of differentiate between this complex ongoing trauma that kids are experiencing. The bear is coming home every night. Um, they're experiencing you know, years of sexual abuse or, or decades of domestic violence occurring in their home. That is very different from a one-time dog bite, a one-time car accident. And a dog bite or a car accident can be a trauma and people can have a trauma response or even develop PTSD or some of these other things following a one-time trauma. Um, but complex trauma is unique in the sense that it is um, happening repeatedly, but also is happening interpersonally, okay? So it's happening not as me and a dog or me and a car, it's happening as violence between two people abuse, neglect, um, is impacts the brain differently when it's happening in relationship. And so um, that is another way that we are kind of thinking about and differentiating. 
sort of what we think long-term impact will look like. Uh, but every, every child is different because every, everyone's ability to self-regulate and to use those coping skills um, is different. Okay, and then we have a follow-up to that as well. Uh, it says following that also, how do we differentiate, <clears throat> excuse me, between trauma and the development of potentially a personality diagnosis? I know that trauma can impact the development of access too, but what about one versus the other? Yeah, so um, kind of like my answer to this question of does a child have ADHD or do they have trauma? Um, they don't have to be mutually exclusive, if that makes sense. So a, a child can have ADHD and meet all the criteria for ADHD, benefit from medication and need that diagnosis for a 504. And that symptomology can be caused by past trauma. So I would say the same thing for personality disorders, right? So they may meet criteria for developing a personality disorder. They may be having, like, as I mentioned, they, there, there can be significant disruption in attachment, especially when those caregivers who are responsible for keeping a child safe are the ones committing the interpersonal traumas, right? Are the ones sexually abusing, physically abusing, emotionally abusing, neglecting, a child, right? Um, that disruption in attachment impacts brain development, impacts the way that pathways are formed, but also impacts our ability to um, self-regulate and to develop coping skills to manage stress, right? And so it's it can be a both <clears throat> and. Um, you can have somebody who is looking like they're developing a personality disorder and they are also you know, someone who has experienced significant trauma. Um, I would, I would say that it's probably a very small number of folks who develop a personality disorder and have never experienced trauma. I would say it's much more common that folks who are developing a personality disorder are, are the same folks who have experienced um, those adverse childhood experiences. Okay. And then, and then we have one more about medications and behavior. So it says, how do medications help or create more problems when children are medicated to help them to control behavior? Are ADHD meds more helpful and less harmful than meds such as Risperdal that are often used for behavior? Yeah. So I don't, um, I don't purport to be a physician, um, though I played some videos that physicians made. Um, and so I, I can speak to it, but I don't want you to take my advice as, as medical advice. Um, what I know is that because we're seeing that trauma has um, direct impacts on brain development, on the release of hormones and neurotransmitters, um, because trauma impacts the brain in those ways, Medications, which also impact the brain in those ways, can um, have an influence on the development and the way that the brain is handling trauma. And so in some cases, medication can be helpful to reverse or mitigate the effects of trauma. And in other cases, um, you know, you may have a medication that's acting in the same way that the trauma did and worsening the effects. And that's why you have physicians and specifically child psychiatrists who know the exact actions of each type of medication and are trying to figure out through testing or through hypothesis um, what pathways in the brains are impacted by different presentations of mental health um, to pick a medication that can mitigate whatever um, is already happening in the brain. I think there was a second half of the question that I maybe didn't, is that true? Um, no, I mean, are ADHD meds more helpful or less harmful than meds such as Risperdal that are often used for behavior? Um, so I think that there is always a risk and benefit to any kind of medication um, for children. I think that medications can be very helpful in some cases. I also think and as I've mentioned already, I don't think we can just medicate a kid and that fixes 
the trauma that they've experienced. And so I don't, I don't come from a place of like, let's just give medication and it'll be all better. I think that kids that have been through trauma need some of the other things we're going to talk about here in a moment. They need, they need therapy. They need a healthy caregiver. They need to be protected from um, additional ongoing stress and trauma. And medication doesn't do those things. But can medication help them self-regulate? Can it help them um, regain some of that self-efficacy? Can it help them manage mood swings? Sure. But it doesn't necessarily um, make them 100% resilient from the trauma in the same way that other types of interventions do. And so I would say that um, can therapy be used alone? Sure. Can um, parenting or family interventions be used alone? Sure. Could medication be used alone? Sure. But we, um, you know, I'm coming from a standpoint of I think that we need to um, tackle things from a variety of directions. And, and I don't think medication is always needed. So I hope that answered that question. Should I keep going or did folks have additional questions? Um, yes, that, that is it. And I think that answered the question great, wonderfully. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, so now, uh, as I mentioned in the beginning for our outline, I wanted to um, take a, a minute, uh, and probably more than a minute because I talk a lot, um, but take a little part of our time today to focus specifically on the issues of domestic violence and child sexual abuse. And so I've kind of broken those out. Um, both of them are considered ACEs. They're both considered childhood traumas um, and both are, are very prevalent. Oops, uh, there we go. So um, some statistics specific to child witnesses of domestic violence. Um, at least a third of children in the US have witnessed violence between their caregivers and most have witnessed multiple instances. So again, ongoing type of trauma. Um, it's, uh, it's less likely for someone to witness just one incidence of violence, more likely that when you've experienced one, you'll experience many. Um, and we're looking at one in three kids. So if you work with children, you're working with children that have witnessed domestic violence, unless you're only working with, you know, two, <laughs> statistically speaking. Um, between three and 10 million children will witness domestic violence in the U.S. this year and every year. Um, over a third of children reported seeing partner violence when their parent reported that no violence was occurring in the home. So that to me is really fascinating that um, parents who reported no violence occurred at home, the children of those same parents, a third of them or over a third of them said, yes, there is violence occurring in my home. And so we frequently hear from parents um, well, we never fight in front of the kids. They never, they never see it. They don't, they don't know about it. We, they, they go to grandma's, they go to their aunts, they go somewhere else. They're, you know, we're, we would never do it in front of them, but kids are aware and they do see it and they do know what's going on, regardless of whether the parents think that they're impacted, they're going to be impacted. Um, and then 40 to 60% of families who present with partner um, violence also report child abuse. Um, that's from this website here on the, on the next slide or maybe two slides later, I'm gonna have a statistic that, that says up to 80%. So huge number of kids who experience domestic violence in their home are also themselves um, victims of violence. So what does witnessing domestic violence mean? Um, this is so important. So it doesn't mean witnessing as in seeing with your eyes only, um, it means being present in the room when, when an incident is occurring, but it also means hearing violence from another room. Oh, we thought the kids were sleeping and it was happening downstairs, but they can hear it. And sometimes kids hearing what's happening, they're creating their own narrative around what the violence looks like. And that can sometimes be even more terrifying for kids than seeing it because their imagination is kind of running um, running with what they hear. Um, and then lastly, just knowing that the violence is occurring, right? So they may see the aftermath. Think about that spaghetti family, the tables overturned, spaghetti's dripping down the walls. 
if the kids were to come home and walk into that, they could figure out that something happened, right? The one parent has bruises or a black eye or is, you know, sobbing hysterically crying and the coffee table's broken. Um, you know, kids piece together um, the situation and that is also considered witnessing. So I want you to think about witnessing as just a kid who lives in a home where violence is occurring, whether or not the violence is occurring in front of their eyes or not. If they live in a home where violence is occurring, they are considered a witness to domestic violence. Why is that important? Because there is a huge risk of injury, right, um, to kids who live in a home where violence is occurring. Um, whether that whether they become injured because they attempt to intervene in the violence or because somebody's throwing objects or breaking a table and the kids are nearby and get hurt by accident, or whether the child is directly targeted as a, as a victim as well. So again, that other study said 40 to 60%, this study says up to 80% of child witnesses of domestic violence are also themselves directly, physically or sexually abused. That makes domestic violence the number one predictor for child abuse. Why is that important to us? It's important because the act of witnessing domestic violence, so living in a home where domestic violence occurred, is considered child abuse in the state of Illinois. And therefore, we need to be notifying DCFS when we learn about domestic violence occurring in a home. Because that kid is at risk for being directly, physically, or sexually abused by being accidentally injured. But also think about the trauma that we're talking about today. That kid is being harmed by the effects of trauma, by the effects of living in a home that is frightening, in a home that is traumatic, um, that child is having impacts on their development of their brain and, and, and so many other things. So we want to be thinking about witnessing domestic violence as in and of itself, right, a form of child abuse and, and making the appropriate reports for those of us that are mandated reporters or those of us who feel um, personally that we have a duty to report. Um, okay, and then child victims of sexual abuse. Um, some, some statistics or specifics there, right? So every 73 seconds, somebody is sexually assaulted in the United States. Once every nine minutes, the person who's sexually assaulted is a child, okay? So that's specific to sexual assault, not just sexual, uh, not, not all sexual abuse, but specific to sexual assault. And then only five out of every 1,000 perpetrators will end up in prison, okay? So we have an issue in this country where we don't, um, we don't go after victims victims of, uh, or sorry, perpetrators of sexual abuse or sexual assault. And when we do go after them, the, they are given no jail time or they are given, you know, um, they're, they're not convicted at all. So we have this, <clears throat> that makes it very hard for victims to come forward and to try to seek justice, knowing that the system fails so many people. Um, and then eight out of 10 sexual assaults are committed by someone known to the victim. And that statistic's even higher um, for child sexual abuse. So 90% of, ch of child victims of sexual abuse know their perpetrator in some way. Remember one in three children will witness domestic violence. One in four children, some, some statistics say one in five, but this website that I used for these statistics said one in four. Um, children are sexually abused before the age of 18. 30% um, uh, of sexual abuse is never reported. And nearly 70% of all reported sexual assaults, okay, occur to children 17 and under. So we have this um, kind of media stereotype of who gets sexually assaulted. And it's usually like a 25 year old woman in a short dress who's walking alone down an alley. Uh, and we need to like destroy that um, that stereotype because sexual assaults happen most often to children and teenagers. Okay, so we want to be thinking about that, right? Um, those who are reporting sexual assaults are minors for the large part, and so um, 
it's not a crime that is driven by sexual attraction or sexual urges. It is a crime um, that is driven by the need to exert power, control, and to abuse others, right? So it isn't about sex. It is about abuse. And we want to keep that in mind. Um, more than 90% of individuals with a developmental delay or disability will be sexually assaulted at least once in their lifetime. So even though sexual assault and sexual abuse happens across the spectrum to, to folks of, again, all races, ethnicities, religions, socioeconomic statuses, and so on, um, there are two um, you know, types of folks that are more likely to be sexually assaulted. And one of them is um, individuals with developmental delay or disability. And the other is individuals who identify as um, trans or gender nonconforming. Those folks also experience sexual assault at a much higher rate um, than, um, than their cisgender uh, peers. Is that the right word? Peers. Um, and um, lastly, a typical pedophile will commit 117 sex crimes over a lifetime. So this is, again, to highlight this idea that it is not a one-time victimization for most folks. Most folks are repeatedly sexually abused, and most perpetrators will perpetrate against more than one child. Um, now, I mentioned this a little bit, right? So I said not just uh, sexual abuse or not just not all sexual abuse, just sexual assault. So when we use the word sexual assault, we are most commonly using that term to mean oral, anal or vaginal penetration. Um, and some of these other touch offenses can be considered sexual assault, but sexual abuse can be both touch or non-touch. Um, so when we talk about touch, again, penetration, fondling, incest, touching of the genitals, um, attempted intercourse, something where one person is touching the other. And non-touch offenses are things like exhibitionism, voyeurism, grooming, um, exposure to pornography, filming of child pornography or, or photographing, obscene calls or text messages. And so um, the reason why I point some of this out is that we have a tendency to talk to kids about sexual abuse from a touch only standpoint. We tell kids, no one should touch your private parts. Has anyone ever touched you down there? And so for kids, that kind of language can sometimes be confusing if what happened to them was that they were forced to watch an adult masturbate. Well, nobody touched me or I was told to touch myself and that person took pictures, but they never touched my body, right? And so we wanna start framing it um, a little bit differently as we talk with kids, we want to open up our definition of sex abuse to include things that are both touch related and also non-touch, but still abusive, right? And so we wanna have conversations with kids that, um, that don't, sound like, did anybody ever touch you? But is it, did anybody ever touch you or photograph you or, or show you their private parts, right? So we wanna use a wider range um, of vocabulary when we are defining sexual abuse with children. Um, does anybody have questions about like specifically related to issues of domestic or sexual violence? All right. Um, so I mentioned some of this earlier um, in recognizing symptoms of trauma. I told you to remember those three children from the Spaghetti family, um, but here I have broken down some of the symptoms of trauma into categories. Um, it's fascinating <laughs> in the sense that uh, you are welcome to kind of come back to this, and I have borrowed from um, the trauma, the child's trauma symptom checklist from um, ICJA's checklist that we use um, for victims of domestic and sexual violence um, in Illinois. And um, really what you have here is the checklist that I used as a, as a conglomeration of um, those different resources. This is in fact, the symptom checklist that we use with our child victims. 
to monitor um, level of symptoms and also to monitor um, like improvement over time. So I, they're broken down into several categories. You're welcome to use these categories or use some of these specific questions. So what we're looking for, for kids who've experienced trauma, we are looking for depressive symptoms, right? So we're looking for kids who are sad, who are lonely, who cry often, who are struggling to have fun, not enjoying activities. So many of you have an idea of kind of what depression looks like in children. So we're looking for that. Anxiety is so common, right? So we're looking for kids who are worried about safety, safety of themselves, safety of other people. These are kids who don't wanna separate from their parent because they're worried about what's happening to their parent when they're not together. Um, kids who are afraid frequently or have fears about many different things. Um, and then also here, what, look at, at the bottom, blames their self for what has happened. So that was a little girl sitting on the chair in the spaghetti family, right? She's blaming herself for what happened. She's worried about what role she plays. She should have done this. She should have done that. She's falling in this, um, into this category here um, related to anxiety. She would probably answer yes to many of these. Anger and aggression, right? Intentionally hurting others hitting, kicking, biting, mood swings, easily angered. That's the baby, right? The six month old who grew up to be a four year old who seriously injured another kid at school. So that kid would probably be answering yes to many of the anger and aggression questions or the mom would be answering or the dad would be answering yes um, to some of these questions in the category, right? Um, so anger and aggression, acting out, externalizing type stuff. Um, harming themselves is in this category, right? So harming yourself is an externalizing type of behavior, though, though many times um, kids or teens may be secretive about that behavior. It is an externalizing behavior, a behavior that is expressing aggression or, or anger um, outside of the mind, right? In, in, in the physical world, I guess you could say. Um, then we have dissociation. Right, so these, these here probably look like the hallmarks of PTSD, dissociation we're experiencing and hyper alertness, right? So dissociation, we had that little boy in the corner, numbed out, zoned out, so spacing out, staring off into space, can't concentrate. Here's that difficulty remembering, we talked about that with brain development, um, but also denying what happened or not wanting to talk about it are forms of, can be forms of dissociation or avoidance. Um, Re-experiencing, so a, a typical flashback, but also nightmares, bad dreams, ruminating about the trauma, having scary thoughts popping into the head that they have trouble um, controlling. Um, and then also that uh, another type of avoidance that's happening, right? So avoiding those um, those places where it happened, those things that remind of what happened and hyper alertness, which we talked about a lot with the brain, right? So being stuck in that fight, fright, that was not what it, fight, flight, or freeze mode, right? So being easily started, startled, not having an appropriate sense of ability to, to sense threat or danger, um, seeing that danger in everything and anything, um, and therefore maybe being impacted in terms of sleeping or staying asleep. Um, social functioning, right, which we've mentioned. So kids that are hyperactive, that are disruptive, those with poor social skills, difficulty making friends, right? So this is coming, hearkening back to what we might label as um, ADHD or spectrum, um, again, it could be symptoms of trauma exposure. So kids who can't, you know, who struggle to, to follow directions or to, or to follow the rules. Um, but then also we're looking in terms of social functioning, we're looking for loss of skills. So a kid who used to be able to write their name and now they can't. A kid who was talking and had a 50 word vocabulary and now only does goo goo gaga and has moved backwards kind of in development. Um, a kid who was potty trained and now they're not. A kid who could self-soothe and put themselves to sleep at night and now they can't, right? So we're looking for that. They had a skill and then they went backwards. That's that's can be a sign of trauma. Um, again, similar to this idea of acting like a younger self. Um, and then of course, we're looking for age inappropriate sexual 
behavior. So there are sexual behaviors that are appropriate at every age. Um, once upon a time, I used to think there were no sexual behaviors in infants. Um, and then I had my own son and I realized, okay, little, little boy at six month old, they do discover their penis and they touch it and they think it's funny, but it's not a sexual acting out behavior. It's not an age inappropriate sexual behavior. It's, it's an exploration that is normal for that, for that age group. Right. Um, and so there are different sexual behaviors that are normal based on an age group, right? So what's normal sexually for a 16 year old is probably not the same as what's normal for a nine year old, which is not the same as what's normal for a two year old, right? So we have to divide out what, what is normal development sexually for each age group and then um, decide whether or not the behaviors that we're seeing are within that, that range or, or whether they are something beyond, right? So a nine year old who is sexually active and who is masturbating multiple times a day, probably that's not normal. But if you have a 16 year old who is sexually active and masturbates at times, that may be normal, right? Depending on your kind of definition of what is appropriate. Um, so we're just looking at it through the lens of development as well. And then physical symptoms that we're looking for, um, that encapresis enuresis, loss of bladder, bowel control. Kids who are sick often have numerous physical complaints. So remember, we, um, in that brainstem, right, we were looking at allergies and asthma and digestive issues and trouble sleeping, like physically impacted by trauma can, can be real for a lot of folks. And so we're looking for that. Um, kids who are putting on lots of layers of clothing or wearing clothing inappropriate for the weather. We're wondering what that could mean. Um, repeated unusual injuries or numerous bruises, um, ongoing pain or extreme pain. Um, we want to be asking questions there. And then of, of course, STIs used in infections and injuries to the genitals could point us towards potential sexual or physical abuse. So we want to be asking questions there too. So these are all all different symptoms that are caused by trauma exposure. They are also symptoms that can be caused by other things. And so just because we say, oh, this kid, this kid is having poor social skills and has difficulty making friends, he must be a survivor of trauma. No, because we know that poor social skills or difficulty making friends could be caused by a variety of causes. But if we have somebody with those poor social skills, we still want to be assessing and asking the question of, is there a history of trauma? Has trauma impacted this kid? Um, and so it's more about knowing that these symptoms are caused by trauma, but keeping in mind that they're not only caused by trauma. So they should raise an eyebrow. They should have you thinking about trauma, but they shouldn't have you definitively saying 100%, this, is, this has to be what happened. Um, because there could be other explanations, right? And so what we're looking for with symptoms, right? Bruce Perry, again, because I love him. Um, simply stated, children reflect the world in which they are raised. And if that world is characterized by threat, chaos, unpredictability, fear, and trauma, the brain will reflect that by altering the development of neural pathways involved in stress and fear response. I like to read this quote and then flip it on its head, right? So if kids' worlds are characterized by threat and chaos, unpredictability, fear, and trauma, that alters the development. So how do we alter the development back in a positive way, right? We eliminate threat. What is the antithesis of chaos and unpredictability? Structure, routine, predictability, right? Nurturing, caring, protection, safety. So we're focusing on doing whatever feels like and is the opposite of trauma, right? And that, that's how we're going to help kids heal and move forward. So let's talk about that, right? So disclosures of trauma and abuse. Um, we're going to, at some point, most likely, field a disclosure. Um, we're going to have a child come forward and, and disclose that they've experienced trauma or abuse. 
Um, and so we, we need to know some facts about what disclosure looks like um, and how to respond. So delayed disclosure, only 50%. And I think the other statistic, again, they're coming from various places, um, said 30% of sexual abuse or assault is ever disclosed to anyone. And of those who disclose, about a fourth of them are disclosed to law enforcement. And so many disclosures are made to your best friend, to your mom, to, um, to folks that are not, in fact, a part of the legal system. Um, many children, teens, and young adults don't disclose until a later stage in life. So they may have been sexually abused at age four, five, and six, but they, they didn't understand it or know how to disclose or know how to talk about it at the time. Um, and so when they hit puberty, when they start to become sexually active, when they learn about these issues later, um, that may prompt a disclosure about abuse that happened many years before. So don't be surprised by that delay in disclosure. Um, and then victims may wait to disclose to someone that they feel they can trust or until the symptoms from the trauma are overwhelming. So remember, if somebody makes a disclosure to you, that should feel um, like an honor because it means they trust you enough to tell you. It means that they have faith that you're gonna respond appropriately. And it means that you're gonna be willing to hold on and hold space for what is likely the most difficult thing that's ever happened to them. And so we want to think about disclosures, not as like, oh my God, I'm in a panic. What am I supposed to do? But we want to think about disclosures as, wow, I'm really glad you told me that. Or that was, that was so brave of you to share, right? And we'll talk about that a little bit more. Um, confusing disclosures. This should not come as a surprise to anybody. Remember, because I told you already, in that limbic system, in the amygdala, we're doing, we're doing heightened emotion and we're doing episodic memory at the same time. And so if we're overwhelmed by emotion, we're not creating episodic memory. So if somebody makes a disclosure and it's, it doesn't seem like it's in chronological order, it seems like they got bits and pieces and it's, it's kind of doesn't make a lot of sense, um, that does not mean it's not true. So remember, we're not going to judge the disclosure. We're not going to, um, you know, accuse them of making things up or lying or not telling the whole story because we know now that not having complete memory of a traumatic situation is in fact very normal. Um, and so what we can do is try to guide them into sharing more from that sensory or emotional memory. Remember, because even though they don't remember first this, then that, here came Joe, and then I did whatever, and then he said something. They don't remember the episodic parts, but they might remember what they felt, the emotions that arose. They might remember the smell or the taste or the feeling of something. And, and so we can, we can lean on that as we allow them to tell their story. Um, and recanted disclosures. So again, I want you to walk away with many things today, apparently, because I keep saying that, but um, I want you to remember that just because a person disclosed and then took it back doesn't mean it wasn't true in the first place. And in fact, it probably was true, but there's some other reason that that child or teen chose to, to recant. Um, so it's very common. Um, especially in children's and children and teens because they lack power and privilege, right? Because we don't give a lot of authority to children or teens. And in the same way, recantation is more common in other groups that lack power or privilege. There's fear of retribution and what will happen. Will they be punished? Maybe they started to tell their story and they could tell that the other person wasn't believing them. And so that that caused them to say, oh, okay, no one's gonna believe me, so I'll just take it back and say it never happened. Um, or maybe somebody just completely freaked out. And so in order to protect that person's emotion and that person from the response or that person from being you know, secondarily traumatized, they, they take it back as a way to try to comfort or, or support the adult who couldn't handle it. Um, and then of course, there's a lot of shame and guilt associated with um, experiences of trauma. Samantha, we do have a question. 
Um, how do you respond regarding verbal abuse? Is this reportable? This is something that is difficult to prove and it sometimes creates an even bigger risk by reporting. The child then could be taken out of therapy and then their source of stability is taken away. I try to outweigh the risks versus benefits in these situations, but I wanna make sure that I am protecting my client's safety in whatever capacity that is. Yeah, um, I think you, I, I think that, uh... Stephanie answered her own question, um, which is that the verbal abuse is so tricky in some ways because we know that verbal abuse is still traumatic. We know that verbal abuse still impacts, um, you know, the development of the, of the child. It still causes that fear response. It can still be very overwhelming and traumatic, but at the same time, um, verbal abuse isn't something that's necessarily taken as seriously by you know DCFS or law enforcement um, because it's it's not viewed as a risk in the in the same way. Um, and so I think what Stephanie's saying is that you have to weigh the risk benefits. What what um, potential risk of harm are you are you creating if you do report that, and what potential risk of harm is there if you don't report that? Um, and so that would be something that even, even though I supervise a lot of folks, that would probably be a situation where I would bring it to another, another person on the team and say, like, I'm too close to this, right? And I have a lot of feelings about this kid or this client that I'm working with. What would you, what would you do in this situation? Um, or you can always call the DCFS hotline and ask them without providing any information, is this something that you guys would be willing to investigate? Because I don't wanna make a formal report if you're not going to investigate it, but, but if it is something that you will investigate, then I, I would like to do that. Um, and they should be willing to, to hear you out without you know, having to go through giving all of the facts and details. Um, and I think that, um, just weighing, really just weighing whether or not um, this, this verbal abuse is likely to escalate into something more dangerous um, or whether this verbal abuse is doing substantial enough damage to the child's you know, brain and psyche that, that you have to try to intervene. Um, so I think just weighing, like, you, like she said, I mean, she answered it, <laughs> just weighing the cost benefit of, of of making a report um, or trying to intervene. Yeah. So it, it, it is tricky. The other thing I will say, which is almost feels hopeless, but also feels maybe hopeful. So you guys can judge that for yourself. But um, though some abuse remains verbal, um, the cycle of abuse tends to escalate what that abuse looks like. And so it, it is likely that over time, verbal abuse may cross a line into physical abuse or other types of abuse. And so also, you know, assessing for yourself, where are we at with this, with this cycle? Are we likely to have um, a dangerous situation and escalated form uh, of abuse that puts a child at, at risk of physical harm? Um, and so you want to be also thinking about whether this abuse is, you know, likely to escalate into something beyond just, not just, that sounds terrible, but beyond verbal abuse and the damage that verbal abuse does. Were there more questions or was that the only one? That was the only one. Okay. I'm just checking my time. All right. So disclosures of abuse and trauma. Um, because what I will tell you is that um, there is this false narrative out there that so many people make on that so many people, right, make reports that are not true about abuse and trauma. So I wanted to just tackle that briefly. So unfounded reports kind of fall into two categories: false reports and baseless reports. So a false report is when somebody reports a crime to law enforcement and that an investigation is able to factually prove that it never occurred, okay? And a baseless report 
is an incident that um, that probably happened, right? But that they can't prove like in court, right? So they, they don't, it's a baseless report because there's just not enough evidence, but it, it's probably the truth. And so when we think about the fact that only maybe 30 or 50% of sexual assaults are reported and and then you think about all the other types of abuse and we're not reporting 100% of what is happening to law enforcement, right? Um, of those that are reported to law enforcement, only about 2% of them are false reports. And this statistic is also true of many other crimes, right? So robbery, false reports are also reported at about 2%. Um, and so when you think about uh, when you think about that, it's not that victims of abuse or trauma are false reporting at higher rates, um, even though there is a false narrative out there um, about that. So if you receive a disclosure of abuse or of trauma, step one is always to just believe that person. I'm uh, sorry. So we're moving into responding to a disclosure. So um, Samantha, I'm sorry to interrupt, but we do have two more questions popped up. Do you want to wait a minute or, okay. Um, the first one is if you have a patient who is spreading theses in the bathroom stall at school, but denies any physical harm in any way, could this also be related to verbal abuse or some type of neglect? Right. So I, um, I can't make a judgment on what is causing a behavior. So like I said before, even, even though perhaps spreading theses could be a sign of trauma, there is not a one-to-one -one correlation. So every child who spreads feces is not necessarily a victim of physical or sexual abuse, right? And so it could be caused by other things. Feces um, smearing is sometimes related to intellectual disability, sometimes related to um, uh, I just lost my train of thought. Sorry, but what I'm saying is that um, smearing feces is not an automatically mean that you have a child who's experienced a specific type of trauma. You just want to be assessing and thinking about whether that might be related. Um, but if you have somebody who is denying it, we don't want to push it onto them, right? We want to just create a safe environment where they can disclose when they are ready, if there is something to disclose. Okay, great. And then the last question is, do you typically inform the child if older, for example, a teenager or a caregiver when making a report to DCFS? Yeah, um, when I make a report to DCFS, um, as much as I possibly can, I, I try to involve, um, and I have a different training that I do on, on, on handling reports to DCFS, but um, I typically try to involve both the child and the non-offending parent in that report um, as much as I possibly can, because that helps them to feel like I'm not doing DCFS to them, but that we are partnering together to keep their child safe. Um, and so uh, there are exceptions to that, right? Like if, if I think that the offender is gonna flee, if I think the child will be at an increased danger, if somebody knows that I made a report, if I am concerned um, that, you know, that there will be coercion and forcing of the child to change their story before DCFS shows up or the police show up, then I might not give somebody the heads up. But in most situations, um, I'm trying to uh, partner with families and, and let them know that DCFS can be their advocate if they're willing to work with me and work with DCFS through whatever situation has occurred. So. Wonderful, thank you. Um, okay, so like I said, we're gonna talk about responding to disclosures. So here's just some examples. What do you say and what do you not say? Um, so like I said, always start with believing. We, we don't have a reason to accuse someone of lying throughout the day. You know what I mean? So if somebody came to you and said, oh, I, I ate at Starbucks for lunch and I got a croissant, you wouldn't be like, you are lying, right? You would just be like, oh, that sounds cool. Was it great? And so start by believing. Um, there's no reason to assume that someone is lying because uh, like we mentioned, false reporting is so um, infrequent 
And most of the time when you're receiving a disclosure, it's not your job to judge in that moment. So again, we want to thank them for telling you, tell them that they're, they're brave for coming forward. Um, you can say things like, I'm sorry that this happened to you. Let them know you have options, right? So you're going to have to make some, some tough choices maybe going forward, but you don't have to um, let people tell you exactly what to do or how to handle it. You are going to have options um, and then let them know that uh, abuse is, is never, never a child's fault. Abuse is never a child's fault. This is not your fault. So remember the little girl in the chair, she blames herself. We don't want, we don't want that to be the case. We want to start putting those new mantras in kids' heads. This is not your fault. Abuse is never a child's fault. <coughs> um, I've heard it said, you never want to should all over someone, right? So don't tell someone you should do this. You should do that. You should whatever, because we don't know what's best for other folks. And we don't know what they should do because every situation is different. Everyone's belief system is different. Um, and so we can just tell them you, this is something you could do, or you could do that, or you could do this. What, you know, what is best for you? Um, we never want to start a sentence with, well, did you, because this is victim blaming, right? Well, did you wear a tight skirt? Well, did you try to fight them off? Well, did you enjoy it? Well, did you get an erection, right? Because this is, is taking the, the fault and the blame away from the perpetrator who is at fault and trying to justify the abuse by blaming the victim in some way. So we never want to start sentences in that way. Um, we never wanted to say anything that implies that we don't believe um, what somebody's telling us. We don't want to make promises we can't keep. So we don't know if they're going to get justice. The justice system is broken in a lot of ways. So we don't want to say you will get justice because we don't know if it's true. We don't want to promise them that they're going to be safe or that it'll never happen again because we don't know, right? We can't guarantee someone's safety from now until forever. We can't guarantee they'll never experience something again in, in their life. And so since we don't have that power, we don't want to make that promise. So that's what to say and what not to say. What do you do? Um, please remain calm, okay? Panicking in these situations is not helpful. It may cause someone to try to recant what they've said, or it may shut them down and think that they shouldn't say anything more. So if you can remain calm and just encourage them to keep talking, just listen, um, just listen and let them tell their story. Um, that's the best way we can respond. Then we can offer support. Um, how can I help you with your next steps? What, what else do you need? Um, we can provide information about options, right? So remember, we we're saying you have options. Then we want to talk to them about options. Please contact a rape crisis center like Mutual Ground. They, you know, they have lots of experience in helping victims. Um, and then, you know, you can also try to safety plan with that person. Um, and that safety plan might include, we're gonna call DCFS or we're gonna contact law enforcement or it might, or it might be who are other safe people that you, that you know that could help you to stay safe. Maybe your Aunt Joni or your mom or whoever, you know, whoever the kid is identifying. Um, please don't panic. Please don't ask a thousand questions unless you are an interrogator and there's a crime that has occurred. We don't wanna just ask a million questions. We don't need to know anything more than what they're willing to tell us. So if we just sit back and listen, that's best case scenario, they will disclose what they're willing to disclose. Please do not interrupt them. Please do not talk over them. And especially, please do not start disclosing your own history of abuse or trauma. It is not helpful. It's a human tendency to try to say, oh yeah, that happened to me too but it isn't helpful in the moment to the victim. We want to keep the focus on them and what they need. Okay. And I am super short on time. So I'm really sorry. I, I thought I was going to have oodles of time based on my initial part, but I will, um, I will go through these last few slides a little bit more quickly and, um, and then I'll get you guys on your way. So what is trauma-informed care? Um, it is two things. It is a way of conceptualizing and understanding clients, which we've been talking about. And it is also a way of interacting and responding to clients with an emphasis on giving clients back their safety, their power, and their, their control. 
So what we want to do is take these symptoms that we've been talking about and see them as adaptations, see them as a way to cope with and manage the trauma that has occurred rather than seeing them as pathology. So many of these, be, these symptoms that we've been talking about occur because of trauma and they occur because folks have learned how to adapt and survive in traumatic situations, right? So things like aggression, things like self-destructive behavior, things like lying or manipulation, these are survival skills that folks have used to get through what is happening to them. And so they're not necessarily negative, they serve a purpose. And we don't wanna just shame people about them. We wanna help people change those symptoms to other adaptations that can serve the same purpose. We're asking folks, what has happened to you? Not saying what is wrong with you. We're asking folks, what does this, what purpose does this symptom, this adaptation, this behavior serve? What need is being met by you behaving in this way rather than why would you do that? Um, it's a strength-based approach. So we wanna come at folks trying to learn about the strengths that they have um, from their unique family, culture, life experiences. Um, and we wanna acknowledge small successes along the way um, and empower them to reconnect with resilience and hope, okay? So um, I have zero minutes left. So I will put these last few slides up. Um, and I will, um, I will just speak to a few of them and then we'll, we'll wrap up quickly. I know that people want to, you know, have other meetings and things to be, um, getting to. And Samantha, so, Tom, are you, I'm sorry, are you comfortable? Someone is asking if they can receive a copy of the PowerPoint. Yeah, I okay. will share that with you and then you can share it out, Perfect. um, for folks who jump off. I understand that. I'm very, I'm sorry. I really, um. I'm usually better with timing, so please forgive me. But um, trauma-informed approach with children, similar to with adults, these are some examples of ways that we want to be trauma-informed. Um, so making sure that we are doing what we would do with an adult, believing the child, giving them decision, making power, allowing them to, um, to have their own power and control in the situation, providing them with information in, a, in an age-appropriate way. Um, and allowing them to make their decisions. These are things that I've already mentioned, right? So the way that we empower children is by removing stress and violence from them, fostering healthy attachment, teaching those coping skills and social skills that may be lacking. Again, combating chaos with structure, rules, and routine, um, and then allowing them to process their trauma through therapy or other services. These are um, the services that I mentioned I would put up from Mutual Ground. And this is, um, this is truly the end of the presentation. So I am willing to stick around if folks have questions. Um, I will move um, through to just the slide that has my information. Um, if you wanna jot it down, reach out to me with additional questions. This is my email and my phone number. Um, otherwise, I can stay for a few minutes for those folks who do have a chance to stick around and, and ask additional questions. I can be here for that. So thank hey, wonderful. you. Thank you, Samantha. That was amazing. And I think we've, we're getting a lot of really great feedback, too, that this is something that they would like for their teams to be trained in as well. Um, let me see. There's one question. Um, oh, this is an excellent presentation. Thank you so much. I would love to spend the full two hours on the last two slides about treatment itself. Mm -hmm. So maybe a follow up um, would be great. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and there were a lot of questions, which is great. I mean, I think that really fosters some uh, discussion even in this Zoom format. So thank you. Um, oh, we we have some more. Okay. Oh, just thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Oh, thank you all. I appreciate you all having me. And um, I just, I, yes, I could probably talk for six days about this topic. So, so, um, and I'm a talker, so I have a tendency to do that. But if there is interest in, um, I think I mentioned um, that I have done presentations in the past about um, like increasing social worker and counselor comfort level with making DCFS reports and sort of what that process is like and how to involve families in a in a 
in a client-centered way in that process. Um, that might be something that could be an option going forward. Um, and also like people are saying, um, if folks are interested in really breaking down um, treatment modalities and what our, um, our work with clients looks like in a more nitty gritty sort of way, we can, we can do that in the future as well, if, if, if you're interested, so. Okay, great. And it does say, and yes, the DCFS involvement training would be fantastic. It's not typically covered in our social work trainings. That's great. We've got interest. <laughs> awesome. All right. Well, thank you so much, Samantha. Thank you all. And thank you everyone for attending. <laughs>